Hi, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Save World, Make Art. I'm Eugene Clark, and I am with the great, the fabulous, the fantastic, the insurmountable, great artist himself, the living legend, Matt Faulkner. Let's give him some applause. Please, please. Hello, Professor Clark. Hey, How are you today? Matt Faulkner. Good. I am <laughs> mobile once again. You're out there, you're out there in search of people saving the world by making art? It's true. And uh, I think I've seen a couple, uh, which made me feel really good. But you know, it is nice weather. So the artists should be out making yeah. art. Yeah. I was just, I just got back inside. Lovely out there today in northern <laughs> Oakland, in northern, just north of, of Detroit, Michigan. That's right. Just north of Detroit, Michigan, in the northern hemisphere of the metro area. Mm -hmm. So who's our hero today? Professor Clark. Uh, I think we're going to reminisce about the great uh, Norman Rockwell. Norman Rockwell. Mm -hmm. what, do, what, do we, what do we think about him? What, what do people think about him? What, who is he? What is he? Well, he's one of these people that his name has come up in one of our earlier episodes. Uh, I recall talking about how he was not considered uh, an artist who would be worthy of an art museum setting for his work until quite recent. It's probably been in the last 25 years. Yeah. Um, but prior to that, when I was in art school, uh, I had to take a trek to Chicago to see his work in person because, you know, he is the legend. But I had to go to the Chicago Historical Museum rather than the Art Museum. And mm. that always struck me as a little, like, what's up? And of course, when you see his work in person, you realize just the mastery that he uh, consumed in his work. And so it made sense that years later, uh, he would have a show in an actual art museum uh, in the city of Detroit, the Detroit Institute of Arts and of course, many others since then. So yeah, it's taken a while for things like illustration and illustrators like him to, uh, to be looked at in the same vein, you know, with other artists. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just, uh, okay, you know what, let's get right into the artwork and then we'll start talking about him. Uh, oh, yoke. All righty, so, uh, I'm going to go ahead and share the um, share the uh, screen. Do that, and um, yeah, he you know he definitely comes with a whole bunch of baggage about who people think he is, um, and and in particular his. Um, let me get to this image first. I won't do this one right now. I'll do this one. Not that one either. Go away. Zoom there. Aha, okay. Now, um, as in particular in American culture, um, he holds a place that is uh, kind of iconoclastic, like uh, mythic. And um, for certain people, he is thought of as the um, the great mystic visual wizard of Americana, all that is apple pie. And, um, and that's true. He did, um, he, he really created a mystique of, from like the 1930s and then certainly during World War II, his work um, told America about what America wanted to hear about itself um, at a very scary time for a lot of Americans. Um, so yeah, this, this is him obviously, and he's posing for this painting, which was, uh, something that he put on the cover of, was, uh, you know, another one of the Saturday evening posts that was the magazine along with look magazine where he really, you know, made his money. And by the way, he made for that time period, he made a lot of money, uh, as an illustrator, um, uh, painting these covers every week or every month. It's nice to be in demand. Yeah. And, um, but he also, you know, Eugene, he, 
fretted didn't i wouldn't say fret i mean he he regretted that he was he did not make fine art he regretted that he couldn't be jackson pollock you know um and um like another contemporary nc wyeth he who also you know like okay well, well where am i just expressing myself and not creating something for a client you know and there is a difference and so um i don't have examples here of rockwell um necessarily painting for himself but i do have a couple examples where he started to do some stuff that was not exactly what the client wanted <laughs> and, ah. uh, yeah so i'm Let's just gonna that. yeah okay so before we get there though i just want to say the, show one image here so if you ever get the chance, and you and I talked about getting over to Brandywine where um, the, all the great illustrators studied with Howard Pyle in Pennsylvania, and then maybe going to Stockbridge in Massachusetts where his big, uh, Norman Rockwell's big uh, museum is. Um, when you get there, one of the things that really floors you, so this is a sketch that he did, is that he would do his paintings four, three feet by seven feet, four feet by six feet, you know, so forth and so on. They're they're big, and he yeah. would do the sketches at the same size. So you go in there, and wow. there are sketches that big. This sketch, I don't know exactly what the scale of this is, but I just wanted to show you. You know, this is one of the things you get floored by. They'll have the final art of this piece. I don't have it here, but and then next to it will be in the, the sketch this size. And we, so many of us, work in such small scale nowadays. Um, to think about somebody that worked at that scale, that's yeah. That's that's monster right there. It really is. I think if that doesn't push him into fine art status, I don't know what does. And he did so much. He would do like three of these for the final art. He'd do three sketches that size. Wow. It makes you wonder, did he have any studio assistants? <laughs> <laughs> I'm pretty sure he, you know, he, I just read something about him today when we decided we were going to work with him. And um, yes, he, he was, do, he would do things to keep authenticity. Um, and he had a lot, for instance, he wanted to have a church steeple in one of his illustrations and he hired an architect to, I think, build a church steeple so he could have it in his, you know, a model of a church steeple, you know, one twenty-fifth scale in his studio so he could light it properly. Oh my gosh. I yeah. believe it. You know, uh, I remember working with a photographer and visiting his studio and he had this actual window in his studio set up uh, so that you could look through the window and see a table with objects on it. And then he was actually photographing in his studio, lighting it the way he wanted. So it looked like the inside of someone's home. And there's this table with these, whatever products he had to, you know, photograph. And yeah, and it was a total setup. And, but when he was done, it looked like you were at someone's house. Yeah. And it yeah. was all a big charade. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, but these I are the things that. you have to do. These are the, yeah. you know, the, uh, the levels that you have to reach in order to create greatness, like Norman Rockwell. Well, that's one of the and things. And Matt Falcon. Oh, oh, thank you, Eugene. You're very kind. I'll get you that 25 <laughs> bucks later. Um, he uh, did a lot of photography. He was, uh, and, and it's pretty clear that he traced. And this is one of the things that has been an issue for illustrators, illustration teachers, um, saying that, okay, he sucks because he traced or he shouldn't have traced, he should have just drawn, uh, painted from, you know, using eye-hand coordination. And then people- Well, are, yeah, go ahead. I don't agree with that because initially when I first started learning how to draw, of course, that was a concept that was put forth, like, you know, tracing is a no-no and, and, you know, you have to be able to, you know, observe and freehand and all that stuff. And, and you know what, there's a place for that, but I'll tell you what, if I haven't seen in art history, 
so so much evidence of these amazing art historical important pieces that have evidence of using the grid. I'm sorry, but uh, it's been around and it's going to be around forever. Yeah, what did Vermeer used to use? I think it was called the camera obscura, which was basically a lens, right? And it would project, yeah. you darken, you put black fabric up in between what you're going to paint and yourself. And it, and it will project through a little piece of glass on the wall behind you, upside down, the thing that you're going to paint. So that's yeah. essentially, that's tracing. That's a light box. Yeah. It's, you know, I have an etching that I show, show my students of an artist sitting in front of a frame that's upright. And it has pieces of wire or string going across vertically and horizontally to create a physical grid that he can look through to see the live model on the other side. And then he has the grid on his paper or canvas. And there you go. I mean, I'm sorry, but anyone that thinks that these artists of greatness weren't using these techniques, they're fooling themselves. <laughs> yeah. And they, and they are tricks. They're hacks. You know, I mean, there, there are ways to get the thing done, to get a certain look, to do it in a certain period of time. I would guarantee you the reason why Norman Rockwell wasn't trying to sit models down for hours at a time is because he, and he would take pictures instead, was because he needed to save time to get the thing yeah. done. There, you know, knowing how long it takes to do one drawing like the one you showed us for that size uh, and the quick turnaround that he had, there's really no other way to uh, produce, be that prolific. Uh, unless you can utilize tricks of the trade. Yep. Um, but by no means are they not worthy. And, you know, you can't pull off work like he did unless you have a great drawing and painting ability. I mean, anybody can trace or use a grid, but it's not going to look like his work. Yeah. And, you know, the thing, too, is like in, in if connecting him with Vermeer, Vermeer's work is about his palette, his his atmosphere, his lighting, his color, his color, his color. Same thing with Norman Rockwell. He was a colorist. And, and you know what, looking at this Rosie the Riveter, I can guarantee you, you know, that he exaggerated things. He may have used a photograph, but um, he was exaggerating. He did. Wow. And he knew how to draw. So, you know what I'm looking, we're looking at here. There's uh, Uncle Michelangelo uh, on the left. And uh, there's the pose for the classic Rosie the Riveter that was a Saturday night poster uh, covered during World War II. Um, yeah. He knew what he was doing. <laughs> you know, when you talk about Michelangelo, who's near and dear to my heart because of my teaching anatomy, and when I think about my teacher, Russell Keeter, who studied uh, from Robert Beverly Hale, who come to find out, was a student of George Bridgman along with da, 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 Norman Rockwell. So the lineage, the lineage, it all right. traces back. Yep. And, um, you know, when you look at this thing, uh, the piece by Michelangelo, I think it's one of the prophets. Um, it sits in Western uh, uh, subconscious as an image that we recognize but don't know exactly where it came from. So you could see this pose elsewhere. And because we've probably seen it at some time in our lives, oh, it's classic. So when he uses that, that pose for Rosie the River, he is basically taking all of the um, import and all of the, uh, the aura of the Michelangelo and putting it into her to make her be that same classical, powerful, symbolic image. And people, we don't even recognize it until somebody points out, yeah, he stole that pose from the Michelangelo prophet. <laughs> but, you know, rather than stealing, he was probably purposely doing that as a way to pay tribute to somebody that probably is meaningful yes. to him and his study of artwork. Yeah. And I think artists throughout the ages have done the exact same thing. So it, it makes total sense for him to want to do something like that because mm -hmm. he could have picked any pose yeah, so when, when bach decides to do something a, a, a derivation of um let's say uh, uh mozart 
people don't say, oh, how dare you take that piece by Mozart and, and adapt it and turn it into something else. It's an honor. Yeah. He's honoring his, uh, you know, who he's, the person he's uh, amazed by. So same thing here. He was just like, yeah. okay, I'm going to use this pose because it's, um, it's powerful. Yeah, and writers do it so often in their work. Um, and then jazz musicians uh, will be playing a particular number. And then as they go into their improvisation, they'll throw in, you know, just a, a couple uh, stanzas from several different songs that you just hear like a little couple notes and you're like, ah, I know what that is. And then it goes right back into the song that they're playing. I mean, it's the yeah. same thing, you know, it's yeah. paint, it's just paying homage and reference yes. to, you know, the, the people and the, the artists that may have come before you, or maybe they're your contemporaries. In this case, it was the artist that came before him. Yeah. So there's Rosie, a uh, better image. Um, again, color, his, his treatment and the lighting uh, and the, just the, um, look at the subtleties in the skin tone. You know, that is just brilliant. You know, the blues uh, that are, you know, anyway, uh, I'm gonna, I wanna jump to this. We're running out of time. Um, okay, one more. These, this is what he's really classically known for having done the four freedoms. Um, these were really big during World War II, freedom of speech, freedom to worship, uh, freedom from want in the lower right-hand corner, and I think freedom from fear, something like that. Anyway, um, they were the big deal. Just before we go, these two images, I'm going to show you another one after this. This were a big deal that he's, he painted these things. Um, yeah. he, was, he was representative of the classic white America. And for him in his late 60s and early 70s to sit down and start saying, no, I'm going to start painting things that are uh, relevant to, uh, this is 1964, I believe, this is Ruby Bridges, going to school, um, and, and paint on the wall uh, behind her, uh, yeah. the N-word. Um, this was, he, he went out on the edge, way out on the edge, to do this. Uh, not acceptable to a large chunk of America that, uh, you know, the average Joe person now uh, loves Dr. King. But the fact of the matter is, uh, you know, average white person now thinks of Dr. Martin Luther King, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King and wants to quote him. But back then, most of white America thought he was a reactionary and, and did not uh, you know, the, the majority. So this was a big deal. That's all I'm getting at for him to have painted. No, you're, you're absolutely right. I remember, um, you know, the University of Michigan loves to, in their commercials, uh, have like a hundred images flash by your eyes of what their university is about. And one is a photo of Dr. Martin Luther King when he spoke there um, at Hill Auditorium. But when you look that moment in history up, you realize that that auditorium was not filled for his speech. And it just blows your mind to think that uh, he, at that time period, was invited and, you know, they couldn't fill the Hill Auditorium for a Dr. King. Like, that's unfathomable to me now as I think back. And I think. Um, that's what makes a painting like this even that much more important because, you know, let's face it, it's unfortunate that we even have to have work like this representing what it does. It's so unfortunate that our country, you know, has led itself into a place where, uh, you know, race relations are so poor. Um, but to have someone of the nature and regard like an artist like uh, Norman Rockwell, who decided that none of his artistry and his career in, was important enough to, to not do something like this and understand the repercussions that might happen, he, that didn't matter to him. And now when I think about this moment, 
I think about this painting and I think many people do. It's such a, it's such a well-known painting that um, you, you think of this painting before you actually think of an actual photograph of the moment. Yeah. I'm gonna show you one more along these same lines. So uh, this is, this doesn't even look like Norman Rockwell, but it is. Um, it has enough of them in it, but this is um, a painting that he did of the uh, three men who were killed by the Klan in, uh, during Freedom Summer um, down south, and it's called Southern Justice. Now, what's really interesting to me is you see the shadow of men with guns on the right side of the image. Um, yeah. And uh, now in the original painting, those men are included. It's a horizontal, not a vertical like this is. But for the finish, Gosh. he decided to just do uh, this limited palette um, and just the shadows of the men. And that's an interesting wow. change. Now, and uh, one more thing about this. When he, when he did this painting for this, I think it was for Look Magazine, he did another painting that had an African-American and he was told to take the African-American out. This must have been years before for this magazine because he'd put the African-American in apparently a white collar job position. And they said, we only show African-Americans in blue collar service positions. Wow. So you'll need to take him out. Wow. So he decided to, <laughs> okay, I can't paint them, you know, as professionals. So I'll paint them as this. Now he, he wow. was, again, he, he, this was putting himself, like you said, you know, his self-esteem, his ego, his um, livelihood on the line. Yeah. Well, it does make you have a completely different appreciation for what he represents. Although, you know, white America was tried and true in his paintings uh, for so long, but yet for him to uh, take a U-turn and become more of an activist through his works. And the fact that he was so well known that these publications didn't say no to him. Yeah. That's really I, cool. I would not be surprised if he didn't have some editorial fights. Yeah. But, um, he he could do what he wanted to do in that because he had become like, you know, he was this icon. Yeah. And he so really cool. did make in that time, he really did make like Steven Spielberg kind of money. That's, you know, uh, 1920s, 1930s, when he's making $1,500 for a cover, that's the equivalent, you know, per week, that's the equivalent of like making 20 grand uh, or more now. <laughs> so. I would be happy with fifteen hundred dollars today. <laughs> I know, <laughs> right? <laughs> you know, so I mean, I wouldn't say no to that today. So, so he was—he really yeah, was so putting amazing. himself on the line, and that's yeah. that to me. Um, the uh, I'll finish by saying, you know, that just the his concern that he wasn't a fine artist, and yet what he did. Who cares? A hundred years from now, yeah. is anybody going to care that he no, did? Of course not. You know, I mean, he did what he did, and and it had and it was potent and powerful, and um, so, yeah, yeah, awesome. All right. Well, thank you, Mr. Faulkner. Right. This has been very enlightening. Yeah, yeah. What's the song? Dun -dun. Matt and I would like to thank you for watching our show. We wanted to help you to learn a little bit about our. What's that? What show is that from? I think it's I Dream of Genie. Yes. I Dream of. I can always turn to you to get the. Oh my gosh. Details down. Thank so you, funny. Gene. All right. Thanks. We're going to say peace out to everybody. Everybody yeah. have a great day. Thanks for watching.